Okay, so this week, uh, this little video over the PowerPoint is going to be a slightly different because you're getting your information for the, the lecture quiz from this PowerPoint, but the details are going to come from the USGS page. So there's a link on the main page. You'll see when you obviously go through that, that there's three places. This little video that's covering the PowerPoint is really just an overview. I kind of wanted to run through kind of the topics and briefly just kind of make you aware of the hazards associated with different volcanoes. But the details, I want you to go to the USGS page and they and under the hazards link, it actually talks a little more in detail about each of the hazards associated with the volcanoes. In addition, there is a part of a chapter from the online textbook that also covers, it is the same material. So I know it might seem redundant, but each has its own kind of quality here. I'm hoping I can give you some insight. And then on the USGS page, they're going to have some imagery and information that's a little more detailed. And in the textbook, there's some more imagery that's maybe helpful, a couple videos that can be useful. So the combination I'm hoping will cover all the bases. So make sure you look at all of those before you go ahead and take the lecture quiz. But really this PowerPoint, also has a link that's telling you to go to the hazards page there's a link on the main page of the module so hopefully you can't miss it you know and here's the hazards that you'll click through to look up the hazards on the usgs page but real fast i'm going to run through some things just to give you an overview you know certainly when we think of volcanoes one of the hazards are you know a, a lava flow now lava flow hazards when we're trying to associate like what's the main hazard associated with a volcano usually the most dangerous type of volcano that has this hazard is a shield volcano and so you can see here mafic composition so if you're remembering from the previous module right we the composition is impacting the shape and the hazards and here because it's very fluid remember a low viscosity they travel fairly quickly, especially when they're close to the source, but they can travel for long distances. Herein lies the problem. Even though you're far away from the volcano, a lava flow can kind of come to your home, burn it down, uh, you know, impact roads, structures, all those kind of things. And of course, there's other gases associated with this uh, lava flow. And so that's another issue. So when we think of lava flow hazards, the big volcano we kind of associate that with is mafic and that's the shield volcanoes now doesn't mean we can't get lava flows with other types of volcanoes like our stratocones and things like that but they're only affecting the local kind of volcanic sides because they're thick and gooey they don't travel as far so yes they're a hazard but you know this is the main hazard of our shield volcanoes because they're not explosive we don't have these other types of hazards so as we move along to you know running down the hazards a pyroclastic flow this is a, another hazard here we're gonna kind of pin this hazard to the stratovolcanoes so now these are our intermediate and yes some felsic volcanism why because of the explosiveness and so this is you know a collection of gases and rock and debris and it can be formed in a couple different ways, but a, certainly a blast is one way to initiate this. And so because the slopes of these types of volcanoes, the intermediate type, are usually steeper, they run down the sides fairly quickly, they pick up speed, and of course they're very hot. And so if you're in the way, mm, that's a problem. And so this is the type of uh, hazard we associate more with an intermediate type volcano. And so there'll be more information, of course, when you go to the USGS page. Poisonous gases can be an issue for sure. And so CO2 doesn't, it's not really, we don't think of CO2 as poisonous per se, but because it's heavier than air and can sink into low lying areas and displace oxygen, if you live in those low lying areas and uh, you know CO2 is a huge amount is released from a volcano, it can settle into these low lying areas displace the oxygen and of course anything in that area would suffocate because there's no oxygen anymore now there's other you know um, sulfuric acid and other thing other types of uh, you know gases that can be emitted that we can test and, and actually look for but you know you want to be aware and this is an example of a a place where there was a lot of co2 released from a volcano that did settle into a low-lying area and impacted a lot of people 
Uh, oops, jumped a little too far. So the next thing we talk about are what are called lahars or just avalanches. So once again, we have a steep feature. We're associating more with our kind of uh, strato and intermediate type volcanoes because they are steep sided. And so we can have avalanches just because unstable and steep, but also we get what are called lahars, which are basically volcanic mud flows. And these can happen for a variety of reasons. Also, heavy rains can induce this. A small eruption that melts a glacier or snow on the top of a mountain. And because these are tall structures, sometimes they have snow on the top. And all that water mixes with the loose ash and debris and then moves downhill. And now we have a mud flow, or in this case, because it's associated with a volcano, a lahar. And it travels down slope very quickly because it's steep. It'll find these kind of valleys, right? So it'll funnel down into the valleys, which eventually turn into streams. And so then it'll race down the stream and it can travel fairly far, maybe 20 miles, 30 miles away from a volcano because now you basically have turned that mud flow into a flood and it runs down the river system and anything living you know on the edges of the river or close by if it overtops the banks now it impacts all those structures and so this is a obviously an issue when we have either heavy rainfall like we said or even a small eruption so it doesn't have to be a horrible like huge blast that everyone's frightened of it's the idea that if there's a lot of water in this case it would be snow the top of a mountain we can melt that very quickly and that leads to this kind of flooding event and then, of course, that leads into the idea of a flood. So the lahar is the, is the initiating mud flow moving down the mountainside. But then once it gets into the stream channel and starts moving, now we have a flood event. Right? And so we saw this with Mount St. Helens. You can see this image here where homes have been displaced. They're living along this relatively flat area in the river. But of course, now all this water comes down, overtops the banks, and trouble, trouble and now your home is mobile so flooding is another problem we associate with that we can get tsunamis now of course certain conditions have to apply now i'm sure you've heard the term tsunami we haven't talked about it yet but we will but basically a tsunami can be generated when you displace a lot of water now of course this image here is from a earthquake generated tsunami but if we have a volcano that's in the ocean and we do, of course, because if we have two uh, oceanic plates that are colliding and get subduction, we can develop volcanoes in, in the oceans, volcanic arcs, they're called. If they have a massive eruption or an explosion or even a big landslide into the ocean, we could generate a tsunami. And so and that'll move in all directions. And of course, for this week's lab, we're going to, you know, hopefully take it easy on you and watch a video and you'll see that Krakatoa, which is the video you're going to watch, just such a thing happened. And so we know that that's a possibility for, for a hazard. Also, earthquakes can do some damage. So magma moving in the subsurface as it's trying to rise, it's pushing against solid rock, causing pressure, stress. The rocks can only hold so much stress until they fail and we get small earthquakes sometimes a little larger but of course the closer you are the more damage it can do so upwardly moving magma can cause earthquakes some other effects that we see from volcanic eruptions we see um, the introduction of ash and so violent eruptions like our intermediate and of course our felsic ones like the yellowstone event so if we throw a lot of material into the atmosphere we can block out sunlight which reduces global temperatures, gives us acid rain, all the falling ash onto the ground can bury crops, do damage to infrastructures, and all those kind of things. So we run into those issues from these blast eruptions. So we're still putting a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. And that's one of the problems with eruptions. And so these are the hazards you're going to look at when you go to the USGS page and the chapter. And then real quick, what you're going to see for monitoring slash predictions is when you go to the chapter at the very end, it'll have a couple different ways we can monitor volcanoes to see if we can predict whether they'll erupt or not. And so we talked about earthquakes, seismic studies. So we're, we're monitoring earthquakes because 
means magma is on the move and that potentially could mean that it's going to erupt so if we understand the magma chamber how big it is where it is we can kind of keep an eye on the volcano other things we might look for that would indicate a volcanic eruption might happen is the ground deforming as the magma moves close to the surface we might get these bulges in the land surface we certainly saw that in mount st helens water temperature changes once again magma is getting closer to the surface it's heating up groundwater the ground itself is changing in temperature compositions of the gas changing all these things lots of earthquakes all these things are ones we would monitor and might indicate that there is some type of eruption that's going to happen the other thing we can do to kind of minimize the damage here is of course we can look at uh, making some maps and so where are the hazards if there was to be an earthquake so here's an example of where lahars might be so if you live in any of these areas we want to be aware that that's a hazard that you might experience during an eruption and so if we make these hazard maps then we can get people prepared right you are in a hazard zone so if there's an eruption you have to have a plan that kind of thing so that can reduce the impact on society for sure because here we could see where some devastation occurred during mount st helens there's a, a kind of blast deposits lahars pyroclastic flows so even after the fact we're kind of putting this the stuff out there so in the future if there's something we can see we know where either not to build or how to kind of keep people safe or away from dangerous areas and of course there's some early warning systems that can be set up so we set up these uh you know seismometers that would tell us something about earthquakes coming we're measuring gases water flows all these things and of course that's relayed now with satellites and all this kind of stuff so it keeps people informed in case there's an issue and finally you have a plan right the 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 plan of what to do and how things should work when there's a potential hazard and you could see this is one example of you know a community's way of handling things right so who's in charge of what policymakers scientists you know you have to have some understanding of volcanoes and then you're you're monitoring some things you're looking at past you're making people aware you're predicting eruptions and so these are all things that you would want to accomplish and then we want to keep communication you know with the public in some way and have a plan like what would we do in case there's an eruption who's in charge who's going to kind of direct people how's that going to get out to the people right so having a plan is definitely something that needs to be done so that you can survive the event right okay so that was hopefully <laughs> trying to make it quick all right, so remember, this is just kind of give, touching the surface. Now, I want you to go to the USGS page to so that hazards uh, link and just kind of read through. It's not a ton. It's maybe a page of each, and you're just going to read through some little more details, a, a little more explanation, some imagery. And then the link to the textbook is going to do the same. And yes, you're going to hear, oh, okay, I just read Pyroclastic Flows, you know, 18 times. I get it but there's also a couple video clips embedded in the book that's useful um, there's other imagery that's in there that's not in the usgs and not in my powerpoint so just trying to give you a variety of information and images so you can understand these hazards better so just kind of run through those and at the end there's some monitoring stuff there's three short little videos so make sure you kind of take a peek at those and then you should be good so as always, if uh, this has wildly confused you or you're not sure what the heck's going on, please reach out to me and I will help you. All right. Good luck.